Now, it's um, back to me again to introduce the first of our two very distinguished speakers for this afternoon. I am going to let both speakers um, uh, give us their talks to start with, and then we will take questions together, because otherwise I think we're going to be a bit bitty in doing it. But the first person who's going to speak to us is a, a truly outstanding woman, Julia Gillard. First of all, I think we should know, which I didn't know so much until I read all the background, just how much she has done on education in Australia. She was Minister of Education, a true innovator, brought in the national curriculum for the first time, but perhaps even more in, importantly, made sure that every Australian child had, was, had early learning available to them. Really fantastic. She also, of course, was the Prime Minister of Australia, which was a, a, a wonderful um, thing for a woman to actually finally be in that position. Though we all know that Julia also herself knows what everyday sexism is all about. Um, and so we're very sympathetic to you on that front as well. She is now, we're even more delighted that she's now Chair of the Global Partnership. Uh, on education. It's great to have somebody with that degree of commitment to education absolutely in there and leading that. So we're really looking forward to hearing Thank from you. you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Whilst I am a long way from home, thank you for making me see, feel so very welcome from the moment I reached Cambridge. A particular thank you too to Pauline Rose, the director of the Real Centre, very well named Real Centre, uh, the launch of which we're here to celebrate today, and to Lucy Lake of Camped. Pauline and Lucy, this is a proud day for both of you, and I really feel very privileged to have been invited to come and share it, so thank you. I'm truly delighted to be here at the University of Cambridge, an institution whose very name invokes reason and research scholarship and the graduation of the occasional Cold War spy. <laughs> Given this university's rich history, it seems appropriate to start by taking you back in time and sharing with you some fascinating research recently published by Rebecca Winthrop and Eileen McGivney, colleagues of mine at the Brookings Institution in Washington. Their work tells us that when this university was 600 years old, in 1809, the number of children attending primary school globally was just around 2.3 million. This number was to grow rapidly during the 19th and 20th centuries as throughout the world, nations, as they modernised, embraced compulsory schooling. In 1880, the United Kingdom joined the movement, declaring it compulsory for children to receive a school education. It was by no means the first nation in Europe to do so, Prussia having led the way more than 100 years earlier in 1763. One can say a lead that they later squandered, but I won't get onto that history. Uh, as the rich but bloody history of the 20th century unfolded, throughout the world more schools were built and more children were educated. The impetus for this change varied. Nationalism played its part, and particularly in the post-World War II era, newly independent countries built a sense of community and citizenship through schooling. The changing nature of the global economy both drove and was driven by the rise of mass education. Be they democracies or dictatorships, prosperous or poor, nations around the world increasingly embraced education for children. The idea that education was a right for all children, irrespective of gender, caste or race, evolved over time. As the world emerged from the ruins of World War II, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights articulated a set of rights and duties for all people, including the right to an education that was to be free and compulsory at the elementary level and directed to the full development of the human personality. That progressive ethos carried through into the 21st century, uh, through to the end of the century. Uh, the millennium, the 20th century, I'm sorry. The Millennium Development Goals struck in the year 2000 declared attaining universal access to primary school as one of the eight aims of the world to be fulfilled by the end of 2015, by the end of this year. In doing so, the MDGs echoed the Education for All approach globally agreed in 1990. 
what this has meant that is that over the last 200 years, the number of children attending primary school globally has grown from that modest start of 2.3 million to 700 million children today, covering nearly 90% of the world's school-aged children. Now, such progress should never go unremarked, and it is worthy of celebration. Indeed, there is plenty of evidence that in just the last 15 years, the Millennium Development Goal for Education has galvanised this landmark effort with the number of children of primary and lower secondary age not enrolled in school dropping by 39%. But as we turn our eyes from the past to the present, what becomes clear is that even with so much progress, there is still an enormous amount to do to enable every child to learn and to reach their full potential. Across the globe, around 121 million children of primary and lower secondary age are not in school. Of the 58 million children not in primary school, about 31 million are girls. It is estimated that 250 million children access some schooling, but it is of such poor quality that they never attain even the most basic benchmarks in literacy and numeracy. As the head of the World Bank, Jim Kim, remarked at the recent World Education Forum in Korea, if these children all inhabited one country, it would be the fifth biggest nation on earth. Looking to the future, there is painful news to absorb on how long it will take to equalise education gaps between the developed and developing world at the current rate of change. On quality, education writer Lark Pritchard estimates it will take at least 100 years, if not more, for children studying in developing country schools to reach the same learning outcomes as those attained today by students in developed country schools. The UNESCO Education for All Global Monitoring Report which Pauline has played such a role in delivering, estimates that at current rates of change, it won't be until 2111 that all children in sub-Saharan Africa will complete lower secondary education. Unsurprisingly, it will be the girls who get there last, with the poorest girls getting there a full 70 years behind the richest boys. Now, to put this on a human scale, consider this. When I left Australia on Saturday evening, I kissed my great nephew, Ethan, goodbye. He is just under two years old. If he has children at the average age at which Australian men father children, and in turn they have children at the same age, then Ethan's great-grandchildren will be born when the world is educating the first cohort of sub-Saharan African girls to universally go to lower secondary education. Think about that. My great nephew's great grandchild. That's how long it will take on current trends. These startling statistics all add up to one dramatic conclusion. Business as usual, the known and predictable rate of change is nowhere near good enough. It means we fail. We fail the world's children particularly the poorest girls. In doing so, we violate their human rights and we deny our world the best possible future because educating girls is so transformative. Girls' education is vital not only for their own empowerment but for the broader well-being of their families and nations. For instance, if all women in sub-Saharan Africa and South Asia had reached secondary school, Child marriages and early births would drop by almost two-thirds. In South Asia, 22 million fewer children would be malnourished if their mothers reached a secondary education. And if all women in all poor countries had the opportunity of a secondary education, we would see child deaths cut by a staggering three million lives. Even if none of these things were true, it would be morally just and right to educate girls. But given these are the facts, it is obvious that the world's economic strength and well-being is maximised by educating girls. So before us, we have a cause and a challenge, 
one that is enormous in scope. But there is good news, some good news. Many are already mobilised and making a difference to girls' education, including the Global Partnership for Education, which I am privileged to serve as, serve as Chair of the Board of Directors. GPE is the only multilateral organisation solely dedicated to education. Our partnership includes donor governments, as well as 60 developing countries, civil society and private philanthropy. GPE is dedicated to the patient work of strengthening education systems in a country-led development model. It is a genuine partnership that works at country and global, country level and globally to enable schooling to be properly and inclusively planned. GPE mobilises resources to fund education in the poorest nations on earth and fully half of our work is in fragile and conflict affected countries. We strive constantly to make the entirety of the partnership more than the sum of its parts, to leverage knowledge, advocacy, exchange and mutual accountability. In Benin, where the primary completion rate for girls is 57%, compared with 72% for boys, GPE's previous and current grant supports the country's education sector plan and focuses on improving access and equity for girls. Providing school meals prepared by a network of mothers has proved effective in getting more girls to enrol and stay in school. Today, more than 120,000 children are benefiting from the school meals program. More than 90,000 primary school girls from deprived districts also receive school supplies each year to lessen the burden of school expenses for their family and to prevent early dropouts. GPE is also present in South Sudan, which has the worst indicator for girls' education in the world, with only seven girls for every 10 boys in primary school and five girls for every 10 in secondary school. In fact, horrendously, in South Sudan, women and girls are more likely to die in childbirth than to complete a primary education. To contribute to changing this shocking reality, GPE is providing a US $33 million grant to directly reach about 10,000 students with activities that focus strongly on the education of girls. Our support includes assistance towards the construction of 25 new schools in the neediest areas of the country with separate sanitation facilities for girls. Over 9,000 teachers and head teachers will be trained in making their school environment friendly and receptive for girls and preventing gender-based violence in classrooms. These are just a couple of examples of the work GPE is doing to make a real and tangible impact on girls' lives. We are restless to do more, to always aim to do better with every dollar and to advocate for more global ambition and resources. In this advocacy and work, we are proud and pleased to be joined by the United Kingdom, which is one of our largest donor nations, and proud and pleased too to be joined by key advocates. Just this morning, I had the pleasure of joining another important global advocate for change, the First Lady of the United States of America, Michelle Obama, who is championing girls' education. Last September, I joined Hillary Clinton to launch Girls' Charge, a new campaign under the Clinton Global Initiative through which 40 companies and foundations have committed over $800 million to improve the lives of nearly 15 million girls. Gordon Brown, your former Prime Minister and now the United Nations Special Envoy for Education, is also a tireless advocate, particularly for children denied education because of conflict, crisis and emergency. All of these efforts by so many are and will continue to make a real difference. But the need to bust beyond business as usual, to slash those 100 year timelines to less than two decades still haunts me and it should press on all of us. After, it all, after all, it appears that in September this year, the world's political leaders at the United Nations will pledge by the end of 2030 to ensure inclusive and equitable quality education and to promote lifelong learning opportunities for all. This promise 
as ambitious and significant as it is will just be words on a piece of paper unless the world steps up. Education globally needs more resources, more research and more innovation. At GPE's pledging conference last June, we raised $2.1 billion from donors and this in turn was used to leverage developing countries to increase their education budgets by a collective US $26 billion. It's a lot of money, but it's not enough money. According to UNESCO, the global community needs to stump up at least $39 billion more annually to provide what is needed to educate the world's children. And make no mistake, that figure is what is needed from donors of external financing <coughs> and has been struck, already assuming that domestic governments of developing countries escalate their own expenditure on education. In the face of this evidence of mammoth underfinancing, it is truly tragic to see the donor nation's aid to education has dropped by almost 10% since 2010, or seven times the rate of decline of overall global development aid. Finding the political will to reverse this trend and bridge this huge resource gap will test us all, but it must be done. Persistent advocacy matters, and I urge you all this year to raise your voice about the need to accelerate investment in education. The lack of resources is compounded by a lack of research. Donors understandably look for the best use of their money to ensure it is directed to what works. In turn, evidence of what works turbocharges the effectiveness of advocacy. That's why I am so pleased to be here today to celebrate the launch of the Research for Equitable Access and Learning Centre. The well-named Real Centre will make a real difference to the world's understanding on what best works to educate the most marginalised and most at-risk girls. Part of what has held the cause of global education back is the fragmentation and paucity of information about effective strategies for schooling and learning. One of the things that has helped build the global movements to vaccinate children and combat diseases like AIDS, TB and malaria has been the clarity of the evidence about what works, what it costs and what gets saved both in lives and money as a result of action. Of course, education is different. A vaccine is a global good with a precise effect. In contrast, education is a locally delivered service which must be sensitive to culture and context. Learning happens over years. Measuring outcomes and improving quality are the subject of hot debates in our own countries. Understandably, such debates just don't magically disappear in developing country contexts. But even understanding the difference between the two sectors, health and education, there is much that can and should be done to improve evidence, identify best practice and develop new thinking in education, including particularly educating girls. My congratulations therefore go to all who have conceived and fought for the establishment of the real centre. The need for this centre is pressing. Thank you for meeting it. And thank you for starting off such an innovation in a firm embrace with the Campaign for Female Education, CAMFED, which in turn is one of the globe's most innovative education organisations. Based here amongst you in Cambridge, CAMFED was founded by a wonderful British woman, Anne Cotton, who is here with us and is now led by the equally incredible Lucy Lake. It is a model that started small, but is both robust and scalable. At the heart lies an important insight. Girls are strong and smart. The terrorists who shot Malala know this, as does Boko Haram, which kidnapped schoolgirls in Nigeria. They fear the power of an educated girl. CAMFED does the opposite. It channels that power. CAMFED recognises that girls and the communities that they live in are the true experts when it comes to identifying and overcoming the barriers to their own education and learning. 
CANFED therefore works with girls and communities in Africa to mobilise support for girls' education whilst it brings financial aid to the education of girls. CANFED also assists girls with their transition to work or further education and then it's alumni give back by mentoring the next generation. In 2014, CAMFED's program benefited 2.3 million children across 119 districts, and to date, 3.5 million young people have benefited from their educational work. When you join together women like Pauline Rose, Anne Cotton and Lucy Lake, <coughs> the energy, energy generated is truly spectacular. As a result, I am absolutely confident that the real centre working with CAMFED will be generating much light to guide the global community as we work to educate every child, including every girl. It's an honour to be associated with this launch of the real centre and it will be fascinating and motivating to see the research that it generates. I'm sure the real centre is going to be one of real achievement. I thank you very much.